We're here at the famous Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles, but we're not up on the display floors. We're actually down in the basement, the area known as the vaults. We're down here because the Peterson Museum is in the fortunate situation of actually having more cars than they can put on display at any given time. I'm here with Wesley Kendall, the chief curator of the museum. How many cars do you guys have in this uh, collection? Well, in the collection, we have about 400 vehicles, but we're only able to display about 150 to 175 at one time. So the remaining part of our collection, we keep in our subterranean storage area called the vault. And down here, it's nice and cool and dry, and the cars remain in good shape until they get their turn in the spotlight. Well, they're still in good shape when they go upstairs. Down here, it's a very stable environment. The, the temperature doesn't change very much because we are underground, and it's, it's a very secure place. Well, there's a whole bunch of cars down here, as you can see, and we're actually going to do two different videos on these cars in an attempt to give you a sense of what is down here. The first video, we're going to cover really historically interesting cars that anyone can appreciate. And in the second video, we're going to cover cars that, this is Hollywood after all, that were owned by famous people and have a real heritage to them. So let's get started, Leslie. Let's do it. Now most of the cars in the museum, and just about all the cars, are real and genuine cars, but this one's a replica. Why is this a replica? Well, you hit it on the head. Uh, the Peterson Museum is not about replicas. We're about the real thing. But the original of this car is so important, and since only one survives, we felt obliged to have a replica so that we could at least give people a representation of how important this car is and help explain it. So if this car is so important, what is that original car? What does it represent? Well, the original car is an 1886 Benz. Uh, Carl Benz built his first car in 1886. A lot of people consider it the first viable automobile, uh, the first vehicle that was designed from the ground up to be an automobile, not an adaptation of a horse-drawn carriage. And that Carl Benz is the Benz in Mercedes-Benz, which exists to this day, right? Right, right. The Benz and Daimler companies did not merge into Mercedes-Benz until 1926, so they were still operating independently. And interestingly, they both built cars individually in 1886 without knowledge of each other. And so they basically share the co-invention of the modern car, more or less. Yeah, you could say that they share the invention of the modern car. Well, let's walk back and look at the engine, because it was really the engine that made this car possible. Now, I guess this is an internal combustion gasoline engine of sorts from 100 plus years ago. Well, this is an internal combustion fossil fuel engine. Back then, they used benzene instead of gasoline. Uh, it's, it's, it was more available. It's what they had. And all the mechanism is out and accessible. You can see it, and it's a, really a wonderful teaching tool. You can see the camshaft. You can see the make and break ignition, the flywheel, obviously, the crankshaft, the bevel gears. It's really interesting. And it looks like it has just one single cylinder. It has sort of a spark plug up there. It has sort of a carburetor. and has this giant flywheel, doesn't it? It's got, it's got the really interesting components. And it's probably the only car that you could actually confuse the carburetor, the gas tank, and the radiator. They're all metal cylinders about the same size. And this didn't have much of a transmission. I mean, this looks like a leather belt drive. It was a leather belt drive. There were two pulleys. Uh, the lever engaged the pulley or disengaged it and uh, engaged the brake. And once this car was out there and sort of proved the concept of a self-propelled car, that's what got the industry off and running and eventually produced everything else in here. Well, Carl's wife, Bertha, actually took this on one of the first long distance trips. She made it to her destination and back. And people were impressed by that kind of performance. And they thought, you know what? If they can do it, if they can make that kind of viable automobile, then maybe I can too. And a lot of inventors were inspired to do just that. Well, it's interesting. It's a fascinating car. Does it run? This car runs. Uh, this car runs. It's operational. It's a little tippy. I wouldn't throw it into a corner. It really gives a, a, a genuine, authentic 1880s motoring experience. We're so lucky to have it. One of these days, I have to come back here and talk you into a ride. <laughs> this is a 1912 Dion Bouton. I'm familiar with Dion suspensions, but I didn't know they built cars. Uh, how important was this company back then? Well, Dedeon was one of the world's very first companies to mass produce the automobile, to, to sell it in significant numbers, uh, a similar model. 
Um, they had a, very interesting racing cars, and they were also one of the first companies to mass produce a V8 engine, way ahead of anybody else, even Henry Ford. But I look at this one, this doesn't seem to have a V8 under the hood. This is definitely not a V8. This is a vertical twin. It's a little two-cylinder car. The ideal car for French driving conditions of the day. It was narrow, it was lightweight, it was sprightly. Uh, it couldn't go very fast, but it could maneuver in on cobblestone roads in tight situations. Now, this doesn't have what we call the de Dion rear suspension. It's more conventional for its day, isn't it? Right. This is fairly conventional in, in its layout and suspension and engineering, but they got pretty adventurous later on. How long did this company stay in business? Uh, Dédion Bouton lasted until about the early 30s. Uh, interestingly, they went from a V8 to a straight eight engine, and some of the last cars they had were, were actually straight eights. Now, were those last cars big luxury cars? Is that uh, the direction the company went? Exactly. Towards the end, Dédion got bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more luxurious, and a lot of their cars were extremely expensive coach-built vehicles. And then the Depression took them out? The Depression did what it did to an awful lot of manufacturers, especially the luxury manufacturers whose market was dwindling. They, they ended up going out of business because the customer base was no longer there. How did the museum come to acquire this car? This car was acquired by the Peterson Museum in a bequest. Uh, a fellow by the name of Gordon Howard, a good friend of the museum, passed and he specified that 12 of his vehicles go to the museum. We're could be more thrilled to have it. Oh, fantastic, and it really adds variety to this collection, doesn't it? It does. It offers a counterpoint to the American driving experience, like the Mercer right next to it. It shows the, the differences between, between the two schools of thought. On my left is a 2005 Ford GT, and you guys are probably all familiar with that car. But this is a Ford GT40 Mark III, and this is the first road-going Ford GT back in the 60s when GT40s were race cars. Leslie, why would it Ford build a road-going version of the GT40 back then? Well, to qualify a car for the class of racing that Ford had in mind for this, they had to build a certain minimum number of them. So they consider it a production car. I believe the number was 25. Of the Mark III versions, they built seven. They built four left-hand drive and three right-hand drive. This is one of the rare left-hand drive versions. Okay, and so if they built seven of these, they probably counted some of the Mark I race cars to make their minimum qualification. I, I believe that's exactly what they did, yes. Well, and, you know, that seems like an arcane thing to do, but Ford won at Le Mans in 66 and 67 with Mark II and Mark IV prototypes, right. but then they won in 68 and 69 with GTs, and those were only possible to race because they had homologated these cars. Because they, they built enough that they consider it a production car. Now, this has, what, a 289 V8 in it? Yes, it does. It has an extremely high-performance 289. Uh, it's a fiberglass body. It has doors that open into the roof, not like a Mercedes Goings, but they're so low that that's about the only way you can get into it. In fact, the GT40 name is derived in part from the fact that this car is only 40 inches high from road to roof. Well, this is a great example of the car. And back in the late 80s, I tested a GT40, and I can't remember if it was a Mark III or a Mark I, but it was road licensed, and it was a fantastic car. And you get into these endurance racers, and they tend to be pretty comfortable because, you know, you had right. to drive them for hours at a That's time, right. and they have good visibility, and the car was a rocket ship in the 80s. Th this thing is insane. It is so fast. Uh, the clutch travel is about an eighth of an inch all the way in to all the way out, but but you know what, you weren't worried about slipping the clutch too much on this car. You were either all on or all off. It really was a perfect car for a race like Le Mans. Very, very long-legged car. Well, and it's not surprising that it's a fast car, even by modern standards, because when you think that it's a road-going version of a car that actually won Le Mans, it's got to be fast. Yeah, it's got, it, it has all the right goodies on it. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a mid-engine vehicle, first of all, uh, first for Ford. Uh, it also has, uh, t for weight balance, it has the gas tanks, one on each side. Uh, and then there's two fillers, one on each side of the uh, front, front flanks. Uh, and you've got a radiator in the front, the engine's in the back, so you've got the, the cooling system that goes, uh, that goes from one direction to the other. Um, all in all, it's, it, but it's really a competent road car, uh, but it's a little warm on a hot day because you don't have air conditioning. Uh, you don't have roll down windows. You can hinge the windows open, but only by about that much. So it's best to drive uh, late in the day, early in the morning, or during the winter time. Well, it's interesting to compare this car with the newer Ford GT because, you know, this car is compact and tidy and very sleek looking, 
until you compare it to this one. And this is all smaller and tidier and, and more purposeful. Well, they, they look really, really similar. And it's easy to see where Ford got the inspiration. And it was natural that they would build a version like that because it was the retro era, uh, a time when retro cars were popular, and why not replicate Ford's Le Mans winning car? Well, and you don't get much better heritage than this car. This is a marvelous heritage. Carroll Shelby was involved in the design. It's everything that a high-class, long-distance racer needs to be. This is a 1955 Ford Thunderbird. Was this the first year for the Thunderbird, Leslie? And, and did Ford build this car to compete with the Corvette that had just come out in 53? This is indeed the first year. 1955 was the first year for the Ford Thunderbird. And Ford did build this car in part to compete with against Chevrolet Corvette, but also to compete with the other kind of upscale two-seater cars that were coming in from Europe. They wanted to be ready with the two-seater just in case this craze took off. Well, was this car as sporty as it looked, or was it just kind of a two-seat Ford sedan? Well, by 1950 standards, it was a very sporty car. It was a fairly short wheelbase, but still had a, a large engine. Uh, but it was mo more of a boulevardier. It was more of a personal car, and that's exactly how Ford advertised it, as a personal car. Now, were these V8 powered? All Thunderbirds were V8 powered. And were they all convertibles, at least in this era? Yeah, the 1955, 6, and 7 T-Birds were all convertibles. They were all open cars. You could get a hard top or a soft top or both or neither. Now, I notice this hard top doesn't have the famous porthole in it. When did those start appearing? Well, you could get a porthole later in 1955. A lot of customers started to complain because they couldn't see out of the car because of this tremendous blind spot. So Ford thought, well, let's, let's engineer a little porthole and put it in there. They experimented with a couple of different designs and settled on that. And a lot of people like that better than the plain version. Now, the Corvette survived as a two-seater from 1953 to this very day. That's right. But the Thunderbird didn't last all that long as a two-seater. When did it become a four-seater, and why did Ford do that? Well, Ford changed it from a two to a, a four-seater beginning with the 1958 model year. And they did that for purely marketing reasons. They did their research and they thought, you know what? We could sell a heck of a lot more of these that they could seat two more people. So they did. And history has proven that they were right. Well, it was a very long-lived nameplate. And it went on from this 1955 car pretty much continuously until the mid-90s, and then That's was right. actually reborn again with a retro car. That's right. Retro cars tend not to last very long because you kind of satisfy the market pretty quickly, and you really don't have a plan B for how you're going to uh, evolve a retro car. If you evolve it, it's no longer retro. So Ford made, made that second version of the two-seater Thunderbird, great-looking car, a, a personal car, just, just like the original. And, uh, but no Thunderbirds anymore. Well, at least this is where it all started. Leslie, this looks like a Porsche 356, but it says Continental on it. I mean, I know a little bit about Porsches, but I've never heard of this. <laughs> well, you could be forgiven for thinking this is a garden variety Porsche 356, and in a way it is. This was built and marketed in America um, because of a fellow by the name of Max Hoffman, who was a Porsche importer back in the 1950s. During the day, Porsche called the model the 356, which is what it was. Max Hoffman said, you know what? Americans would be much more likely to buy this car if you gave it a sexier name. And Porsche thought, well, okay, you're the boss. I mean, you're, you're the importer to America, so you probably know what you're doing. He said, let's call it Continental. That'll give it an aura of elegance uh, because the continent of Europe, it'll imply grand touring and other positive things. So for a while, during 1955, Porsche did. They put the Continental badge on each side of the car, on each front fender. Then they got a phone call from Ford. Ford said, you know what? You can't call your car the Continental. We own the name Continental. You're gonna to have to think of something else. So interestingly, Porsche said, okay, we won't use Continental. We get it, you're bigger than us. We're not gonna argue with you. We'll call it the European. So believe it or not, for about five or six weeks during 1955, 1956, there was actually a Porsche European. It had European script on the side, but it was intended for the American market. It's an interesting story because Max Hoffman was also the Mercedes importer. I think he's the guy who convinced Mercedes to do the Gullwing. So generally, he was not out to lunch on his suggestions, but perhaps on this one, he kind of missed the boat. Probably wasn't his best call. Were there any other changes on the car from the European 356 other than the name? 
Um, not really, but you can tell that this particular car was intended for the American market primarily because of the white walls. If you look, it's got giant white wall tires with unidirectional um, air vent rings around it that, you know, two for the right and two for the left, they're very specific. And it's, it's kind of a Boulevard EA. It's a, it's a plush European sports car, uh, but very much in the American market. So maybe the plushest Porsche until the appearance of the Panamera recently. That's, well, you, you, you could say that, I suppose. It's, it's a very comfortable driving car. It's nice overstuffed seats. Uh, the top is well padded, so you're insulated not only from the, uh, the temperature and what's going on outside, but from the noise as well. Huh. Lovely car. This is a 67 Dodge Coronet, and while it looks as plain Jane as a white refrigerator, this is really a muscle car, isn't it? This thing will get you down the road a lot quicker than any refrigerator is going to. The secret behind this car is the 426 Hemi engine under the hood. The racing Hemi, dual four barrel carburetors underneath it. And you could be forgiven for thinking that this car is grandma's grocery getter because it looks, it doesn't look very menacing. But once you get under the hood and see what powers this bad boy, and once you get your foot on it, there's no mistake. Well, and you know, Dodge built obvious muscle cars like the Charger, right. but this thing was built as a drag car to actually race at the strip. And you see things like the lack of wipers and the simple steel wheels and no options on it. So this was a serious race car, wasn't it? Well, it was a serious race car. And you make some very good observations because this car was delivered intentionally without wipers, without hubcaps. Even the battery was moved from the front to the trunk for a, a bit of an improved weight distribution. And it also has this gigantic hood scoop on the front that it needed to gulp all that air for the big engine. Well, Chrysler in those days was really serious about building its performance reputation by helping drag racers. So That's they right. made these cars available. I, I, I heard that some of these were actually acid dipped to make them a little lighter than normal. Do you know if that well, was the case? Well, I've heard that too, that some of them were acid dipped to make the uh, panels lighter. And some of them were actually had fiberglass body panels also. Now, this car looks perfectly clean, but do you think this example was actually raced back in the day? My hunch is that this example was indeed raced in the day. Very few people would have bought one of these. And this extremely unusual car, rare when it was new and almost impossible to find today. So if you had the money to buy one of these back in the day, chances are you were going to go racing with it. And that is the very reason that Chrysler did not supply a guarantee with this car. They knew what you were going to do with it. Well, I was uh, 16 years old back in 1967 when this car was was current and I remember looking around at them and you paid a few hundred bucks to get a 440 and it was a much bigger increment to get the Hemi because it was the serious race motor. Well the Hemi was a complicated engine to build. You had the, the cross push rods and, and a lot of other things that, that a regular overhead valve engine didn't have. It was all worth it because the power was substantially greater. And today these cars are worth a pretty penny. These cars, anything with the 426 Hemi badge on the side is worth a whole lot more than its, than its counterparts. This is the 1967 Toyota 2000 GT, and this has to be the sexiest Toyota built since the recent uh, Lexus LFA. What was Toyota thinking to build a car like this back in the mid-60s? Well, you're right about the sexy part. This has to be the, uh, Japan's first supercar. The idea behind this car was to build something that could rival the best that Europe had to offer in terms of sports car and GT cars. And actually it wasn't a design of Toyota's own. It was designed by Yamaha and offered to other manufacturers who refused it. Toyota was the one that took them up on it and ended up building the archetypical Japanese sports car. Very long hood, very short deck. So Yamaha designed the whole car? Because I know Yamaha has a history up until the present day of working on high performance Toyota engines, but they That's did right. this whole car? I don't think they did the whole car. What they did was mostly the mechanism and they, they laid out the, uh, the mechanical components. And that the engine was a double overhead cam inline six, kind of like a Jaguar engine, except it was only two liters instead of four liters or so. You, you're absolutely right. The very early ones in the Toyota 2000s were double overhead cam. The later 2000 GTs had single overhead cam engines. And the roof line even looks vaguely Jaguar-esque. I mean, this is a fastback that looks very much like an E-type coupe of the era. So well, inspiration it, or copy. Uh, well, you're right, you're right. The, uh, you know, the Japanese just designers derive their inspiration from wherever they could find it. And why not 
be inspired by the best. How long were these cars in production and roughly how many were built? This car was in production uh, only a couple years during the late 60s and only about 200, 250 were built. Did most of them come to the U.S.? Very few of them came to the U.S., but this is one of those rare examples that not only was a U.S. car, it was actually delivered new in Los Angeles, sold new right here in L.A., and it's unrestored. This car has not been restored. It was repainted once, the original solar red, but the interior is 100% original and so is the engine. Well, it looks to be in great shape. And of course, coming to the US, it's left-hand drive. In Japan, they would have been right-hand drive. Were most of these cars right-hand drive, do you know? I would think that most of these were indeed right-hand drive. Um, and also because of, of where they were raced. Uh, there were, a lot of them were raced abroad. And even Carroll Shelby had a hand in preparing some of these for racing. Oh, it's an amazing time capsule. And it's uh, remarkable to think that beneath the bland skin of a Camry, there is some, some of the genealogy of a car like this. Well, Toyota has a lot of history and a lot of history to be proud of. And this is a marvelous car any way you look at it. This is the Foo Sniper, and it strikes me like sort of the modern idiom of custom cars that have an old look, but a little bit of a more modern technology. What, what is this car based on? This car is based on the mechanicals of a Viper, a V10, very potent Dodge car, all about performance. Uh, this is exactly as you mentioned, it's a kind of car that, that appealed to people who want the look of an earlier car, mid-50s, kind of a rounded automobile with modern performance, modern reliability. Where does the look of this car come from? What does it harken back to? Well, this car began life as a 1954 Plymouth convertible. And it, really speaks to the genius of Chip Foose that he was able to take a car like that and mold it and, and reconfigure it in such a way that it still looks like a 54 Plymouth Savoy, but it, it's very updated and there's, there's, almost, there's almost nothing 54 Plymouth really about this car. Well, when you say it started out life as a 54 Plymouth, do you mean it started out from on a piece of paper or physically the parts were 54 Plymouth well, the, that he modified? The car was a 54 Plymouth that, that Chip Foose modified by putting it on a Viper platform and giving it um, a lot of uh, visual enhancements. And from what I gather, it's not just the Viper V10, but it has Viper suspension as well and Viper brakes. So it's really a pretty modern car that way. It has all the Viper underpinnings, making it a very modern, very reliable car to drive. Now this car seems very, very low, and I look at it and I would think that it has no suspension travel at all and probably rides horribly. Have you driven this car, and how does it work on the this, road? This car runs absolutely fine, I can assure you. It's comfortable to drive in. Of course, it's a performance car, so it's, a, it's, um, it's pretty tight. So it's not something that you, you, know, you glide over potholes in, uh, because it, it's, a, it's a pretty competent road car. And for a competent road car, that's exactly what you want. And I mean, it doesn't really have a back seat, but it looks like these two front seats are pretty comfortable. And the interior of this car is as stylized as the outside, isn't it? Well, this car is all about business. So you've got front seats that really hold you in place. And you don't have a back seat. You've got a package shelf instead. This is the 1925 Ford Golden Star, one of the great street rods. And this was a real award winner, wasn't it? This car won the America's Most Beautiful Roadster trophy twice. In 1989 and 1991, only a tiny handful of cars have ever had that honor twice. Who built this car? This car was built by Ermi Immerso, very, very famous hot rod builder from Southern California. And you look at this, it is as different from a 1925 Ford as you can possibly imagine. Because the idea when you're competing in for the America's Most Beautiful Roadster Trophy is to have something that is completely different from anybody else's to show new things, to be as innovative design-wise as possible. Well, one of the differences I see is this engine. And it is a Ford engine, but it's the double overhead cam V8 that Ford designed to go IndyCar racing in early 60s or so. And to see that in a streetcar uh, 25 years after that race is just amazing. Well, we don't think that Ford had this car in mind when it was developing that engine. But it certainly fits nicely, and it's just the kind of thing that would capture the judge's attention. Well, it's got a cool detail to it, too, because as I recall with that Ford engine, the exhaust came out the center and went out the back. And here it looks like they had to reverse the cylinder heads in order to get the exhaust that's down a, at the that's bottom. That's exactly what they did. The intake is on the top, the exhaust is on the side, and out, out through the back. And other interesting things about this engine are the 24-karat are the gold-plated details, the velocity stacks, 
the uh, hose clamps, a lot of things on, on this engine. But again, it's just to capture the attention of the judges is the, and it really increases the wow factor. Now, you know, a lot of these cars don't necessarily drive terribly well, but you know, this looks pretty serious. It has big brakes on it. These look like uh, wet uh, road racing tires. Uh, I don't know how well this car goes, but it sure looks like it would go pretty well. Well, it looks like it would go pretty well, but I don't know that you'd want to drive this car because every mile that you put on it, it diminishes its jewel-like appearance. Was this car ever restored or is this as built? This is as built. It's exactly as it left the 1991 America's Most Beautiful Roadster Award. Well, I guess when you don't accumulate a lot of miles, it's a little easier <laughs> to maintain your condition. Now, you've mentioned that you exercise the cars in the vault because it's good for the cars that's, to keep them from drying up. That's right. Do you even exercise a car like this one? A, there are a couple of cars that we're not going to exercise. This is one of them. They're, they're cars with, with engines that are prepared for show purposes that really weren't meant to be driven. Be, driving those cars isn't what it was about. It was about more how they looked. And we want to be sensitive to that. And so those particular kinds of cars, we just leave them alone. This is a 1952 Ferrari Barchetta. Back in those days, was this a racing car or a street car, or were they more or less the same? Well, this particular car is a little bit of both. It's got some racing elements and some street car elements. Primarily, it's a road car that was delivered brand new with a racing engine. That's why we call it a 212-225. The 212 is the chassis, the 225 is the engine, an upgraded racing engine. And does that mean it was a bigger engine? Because in those days, didn't the 212 signify the displacement per cylinder of the V12? That's exactly what happened. Um, it's not only a larger engine, slightly larger, but it's got better carburation and it has uh, a higher performance, uh, higher compression ratio, and other uh, enhancements because of its racing nature. Now, I understand this particular car was given by Enzo Ferrari to Henry Ford II. Uh, how did that happen? <laughs> well, there was a time when Ford and Ferrari were thinking about getting together, and Ferrari wanted to curry Ford's favor, so he gave them this car. But I, I thought that uh, Ford Ferrari uh, potential marriage was in the 60s, but this would have happened in the 50s. Were they already talking about well, getting together all, then? They were already talking about it. There was uh, a lot of background that didn't just happen in the 60s. There was quite a bit that led up to it. Okay. I see on the badge on the hood that this uh, car was bodied by Touring. And these days, you know, we think of Ferraris as Pininfarina bodied cars or maybe Scaglietti bodied cars. And cars for the last 20 or 30 years seem to have been that way. When did uh, Ferrari switch from Touring to these other coach builders? Well, there's a time in Ferrari history very early on where Enzo Ferrari didn't really know what the look of his cars was going to be. And it didn't end up being Pininfarina solidly until the 1950s. So he experimented with different coach builders just to get the right look. A touring Superleggera was one of the early ones. Ghia bodied a lot of early uh, coach work. So did Vignale and some others. What does Superleggera mean? Uh, Superleggera is Italian for super light. And it's a type of construction that Touring used to keep the weight down of its bodies. So does that mean aluminum body and tube frame? That is exactly what it means. It means that the tube frame is constructed almost like the bones. And then the skin, which is the aluminum body, is put on that. Then the whole structure is welded to the chassis. In looking at this interior, there's sort of this, almost this leather combing with a, a baseball glove type of stitching on here. Was this standard or some unusual detail on this car? Well, this was fairly typical of Touring Superleggera, but only Superleggera. I think there might have been one or two others that had that, but it was just a way to give this, this Touring car more of a luxury feel. I understand this car is original. It's a 60-year-old car with original paint and unrestored. You're absolutely right. This car has not been touched. It's the original paint. The engine has never been out or apart. Uh, the tires are even date coded to within one or two years of 1952. So who knows about the tires? Fantastic, an amazing car. It's glorious. This is a 1929 DuPont Model G. And I've never heard of the DuPont Car Company. Is this the same company that makes chemicals? And if so, how do they get into the car business? As a matter of fact, it is. It's the same company that made the chemicals, and the son of the scion of the DuPont family thought that he'd want to build cars. So his dad said, okay, sure, go ahead and build cars. So he put a company together, and he, and he did just that. Well, this looks like a very sporting car. Was that the intent here? This is really sporting car. It's a very large car, but it's so rakish. It, can, it has a great presence to it. It's powered by a straight-eight Continental engine, 
which is a, uh, it's a flathead engine, but it's got a cover on it to make it look like it was an overhead valve design, which is what a lot of people did in, in the style conscious 1920s and mm. 1930s. They kind of wanted to make, make their engines you know, seem a little bit more than they actually were. Um, a couple of other unique things about this car from the front are the wood light headlights, those quirky little lights with, with the slit lenses that um, the selling point was that they would refract light in a certain way that it would actually throw a better beam than, than regular headlights. Did they do that? They did not do that. In <laughs> fact, in fact it, they were really deplorable, but they sure look good, especially on a car like this. The other distinctive feature about the, this car is the genuine Lalique radiator mascot. Uh, Lalique had a couple of dozen different varieties of those that you could pick out of a catalog. Uh, there were hundreds of manufacturers of radiator mascots in the day, and uh, Lalique was probably probably one of the best known. A lot of uh, motorists, what they would do is they would put it on a plinth that had a little light in it. So when you turn on the headlights at night, that would light up. Ah, very cool. Now, who designed this body? Did do a young DuPont design it, or did he hire someone to do it? <laughs> the body on this car was designed by Merrimack a company that did a lot of DuPont bodies and was a coach builder to a lot of different Detroit manufacturers. Uh, but this one is especially interesting because it's one of two Roadster versions available. Uh, there was a taper tail Roadster that had a spare tire sitting on the top and you had a boat tail, which is this, and a really sexy boat tail and it really does look like the end of a canoe turned upside down when you're looking at it from the back. It's, it's really a striking, striking design. Well, the other cool thing about this is I noticed this front fender turns into a running board and is one continuous piece goes into the rear fender and it's sort of spaced out from the body. So it's wide, but it doesn't look wide. It gives it a sense of openness there. Right, the car is very narrow, but the fenders stick out from the body a good six or eight inches in some parts. And it gives it a whole different feel. It separates it and it gives it a look of its own. It gives it a whole different sweep of line. Well, it's a great looking car, but the question then is how successful was it? How long was the DuPont car company in business? Well, the DuPont wasn't in business for very long. They only lasted from about the late teens to the early 30s, and then by that time they were done. It's like so many cars, uh, it died during the depression. Uh, there just wasn't the market base out there to keep it going. And this car cost over $5,000 brand new in 1929, and that was enough for a house and a half in the day. Well, it's a real shame because from that era, this has to be one of the prettiest American cars. Well, this is, this is such a pretty car. It has great presence. It has a very unusual grill treatment. And it was special enough that for Mary Pickford because she had one identical to this car. But unfortunately, only one DuPont Model G Speedster is known to have been destroyed and it was hers. This is a 1925 Rolls-Royce Phantom with a special body by Yankara. But before we talk about that body, tell me what differentiated a Phantom from a regular Rolls-Royce, if in fact any Rolls-Royce could be a regular car. Well, for a long time, Rolls-Royce had a one model policy. When they were done with the Silver Ghost, when they evolved that to, to the degree that they, that they could, they brought out another model, which was the Phantom. Instead of having uh, two blocks of three cylinders, it had one block of six cylinders, very big cylinders, over seven liters, uh, that could push this car down the road at a pretty good clip. What was the idea behind this body? I, I, I see that this is described as an aerodynamic coupe, and right. I see these teardrop headlights and the full wheel covers and the fastback, but why make a car like this aerodynamic? Well, when you think of the times, um, Rolls-Royce didn't sell the entire car. When you were, what you were buying from the Rolls-Royce factory was a chassis. Uh, the chassis, the frame rails, the engine, the running gear, the wheels and axles, everything that you needed to make the car actually go down the road. And then you would send it to a coach builder and the body would be built. And the body could be built to any specification of your choice. Was that, was that true for all Rolls Royces or just the Phantom? Every Rolls Royce before World War II was delivered in chassis form only from the factory. And then an individual coach builder would finish it for the customer. This car actually started out life in 1925 as a Cabriolet by Hooper. But it's it apparently not a very inspired design because in 1934, when it was nine years old, the owner of the time, we believe somebody living in Belgium, had that body thrown away and had this body built for it. When your Rolls-Royce body wears out, you don't throw the whole car away. Rolls-Royce is much too expensive a chassis. You just had a new body built. And the individual had it built in an aerodynamic style, which keep in mind, this is 1934. So we're in the height of the Art Deco era 
where, and uh, geometric shapes and, and round sweeping contours and covered wheels, those are all fashionable then. And they took it one step further and they gave it a sloping grill, one of only about half a dozen Rolls Royce ever delivered new before World War II with a sloping grill. They also gave it a fin that, that rises to 18 inches in the rear, two sunroofs, round doors, and windows on the doors that open in a fan pattern. Now that has nothing to do with aerodynamics. That's just pure style, isn't it? That has nothing to do with aerodynamics, and you, you said it, it's pure style. The reason this car was built to w was to win Concorde d'Elegance. Back then, you had to capture the eye of the judges. You had to stand out in a very, very uh, bold way. And obviously, the original owner of this car took a number of prizes, including the Prix d'Honneur at Cannes in the mid-1930s. This car seems very high. I mean, it's as tall as I am. Is the, is the frame so high on these cars? Is that why it's so high off the ground? The frame is extremely high. In fact, the floor of this car comes up to about here. Now, you said before that this car was actually junked at some point and someone found it in a junkyard and brought it from there to this magnificent shape? Yeah, keep in mind that in the, in the 40s and early 50s, this was a used car, and it was a crazy used car. Um, fins were all the rage, Cadillacs and things like that, and even though this car had one giant fin in the back, it wasn't what people were looking for. So this found its way to a junkyard in New Jersey, believe it or not and a, an entrepreneur by the name of Max Obi discovered it, uh, fixed it up, had it painted gold, and then took it around to various auto shows and charged people a dollar to enter an enclosure to look at it, at this car along with other cars. And then eventually someone else found it and restored it to its original condition. Right, the car changed hands a couple of times later. It actually at one time ended up appliance white, and that is the condition that Mr. Peterson found it. And we had it completely restored um, back to a more correct color for the era. We're pretty sure it wasn't white originally. So we thought that black would suit the contours of the car and show it off to its best. This is a 1939 Bugatti Type 57 Adelante. And aren't those Type 57s among the most treasured Bugattis? Well, they certainly made more of them than they did almost any other model. It was the last Bugatti that was made before the war in any numbers was the Type 57 and the S and FC and C variants. It was very, very popular because it gave a lot of coach builders um, enough wheelbase to work with and built, built some pretty creative, swoopy things on them. Now, this is a Gangloff uh, car, isn't it? Right. Uh, Gangloff was a coach builder very near to where Bugatti's uh, workshop was in Multan. And these Adelantes, a lot of the ones I've seen, have all had some sort of fin on the roof or on the back end. Right. This one has some of that too? This one has a little hint of a fin on the rear. It doesn't have anything on the roof because the roof on this car is actually canvas and it rolls back. Just over, just over the seat, the, the frame rails on the side are fixed, but the roof can roll back for that extra bit of sunshine. I, I notice that the doors here are hinged in the back and open from the front. Is that true on all 57s as well, or most of them? Well, it depends on the coach builder. Uh, if, you, if you were the original owner and you wanted your door hinged at the front and latched in the back, you could have had it that way too. Now, what's under the hood of this Type 57? Under the hood is a 3.3 liter straight eight double overhead cam engine with a supercharger. Pretty potent machine in its day. Now, was this purely a road-going car, or were there any 57s that were raced? Well, the Type 57 was intended to be a road-going car, but there were Type 57s that were raced. Type 57G was the model that was most closely associated with racing. Well, I've seen quite a few of these cars, and each one's prettier than the next one, and this is just a great example here. Well, it's hard to go wrong on a Bugatti. You've got that marvelous horseshoe radiator. You've got the wheelbase to give you room to, to put some style in there. And again, it's the height of the Art Deco era, and, and the, the coach builders were really at, their, at the top of their game. Well, you can really see that, and uh, yeah, this is as much a piece of art as a mechanical uh, device. It's a piece of sculpture. Well, that gives you a flavor of the 150 or so cars down here in the vaults of the Peterson Automotive Museum. As you can see, they cover every era, there's every type of car, they cover a variety of styles. If you want to see these cars firsthand, Leslie, how can someone come in here? Well, there's plenty of opportunity. We have tours throughout the week, in the morning and in the afternoon. I would encourage people to go on petersen.org for specific times. That's it for part one of our Peterson Vault Tours. We're also going to do part two, when we're going to look at another sampling of interesting cars, except these cars also have really interesting owners. I'm Chabachara. See you next time.